Welcome to EliaoChannel.com and EaglesHavenMinistry.com and EliaoChilds at gmail.com. And uh, so you can contact us and uh, communicate with us either through YouTube chat or you can communicate with the email. Uh, just want to start and begin. We're going to be sharing about today about the parable of the sower and the seed and not just the, the different aspects of the understanding of the particular uh, soil, but we're going to be sharing more in detail of also the seed, the person, of the who is the wicked one, or Hashadan, that planted seed. And what does it mean he planted seed? To grow together as tars among the wheat. As you see, the, the tar goes straight up, and the wheat bows humbly, bows itself down in weight of nourishment. But the tars are prideful arrogant. They're like a goat, stiff neck, puffed up, high-minded. And as always, we want to let you know that, and Yahuwah Elohim said, open his mouth and his ears that he may hear and speak with his mouth with the language which has been revealed. For it had been, had ceased from the mouths of all the children of men from the Yom of the overthrow of Babel. And I opened the, his mouth and his ears and his lips, and I began to speak with him in Hebrew, in the tongue of creation. So as we, as in our ministry, if you're never, not familiar with our ministry, we are taking people back to the original language of our forefathers, and we're correcting the words of different words. It's called replacement theology, but replacement theology, correction of words. We're reverting and correcting and putting things back the way it's supposed to be. These are the scriptures that we're going to be focusing on. Uh, we're not going to use Mark. You, I just got it there so you could check it out and, uh, and you can, um, focus and write it down in, in a note. And uh, look at the other scriptures of references in parallel of the scriptures. But we're going to focus on Matthew, Matthew, Yahoo, but also start off in Lucas. And again, if you're not familiar with us, we're going to be using correct words because we're getting people to bridge across. And once they're across, they start using the correct language. So you're not familiar with us. Uh, you can take a screen capture of this and see how we corrected the words that are in the King Imus or the Christian Bibles that are using Latin and um, the Latin Vulgate, Catholic Church, and the Geneva translation of certain words that are not in the original Greek or in the original Hebrew. Uh, so let's go on. And so now, as we begin to look at this and uh, come to an understanding of Revelation, we're going to realize that the enemy is doing the same, exactly what the Mashiach said. So let's go ahead and begin in Lucas, Luke 8, verse 10. And he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the reign of Aloha. I use Aloha uh, from here on yet because that's of the lament, the El, the mighty one, the mighty uh, in expression to our creator, Yahuwah. So uh, it's an El of lament, but yet they use El. And I have other videos explaining this, but just to let you know, even though we're reading it like this, but to do the rest in parables, that seeing they do not see and hearing they do not understand, and this is the parable of the seed is the word of Aloha. And it's found also in Matthew, Matthew you know, chapter 13 and Mark 4. And those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, least having believed they should be saved. Now, right now, as you can see, I'm using the scripture 1998. 
uh, the ISR. And we're also going to be using uh, King Imus uh, for reference of Hebrew and Greek if we get quickened to do that as we're studying this. Okay, verse 13. And those on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with chai, with great, uh, receive the word with simcha, kara, and these have no root, who believe for a while in a time of trial fall away. So they receive the word. We see that happening among today, where people receive the word, but yet because they have no root, who believe for a while in a time of trials fall away, going through trials and tribulations, or the transition change and the persecution of their family, etc. Many of us are the followers of Yah. We are going through that even today. Many new baby believers or new beginners, they are, they come to the know the true name of the Abba Father Yah and Yahuwah and the true name of Yahushua, the Mashiach that walked to earth, the Hebrew Messiah. And they don't, they celebrate the, the seven feasts along with the, the, the covenant of the earth, the Shabbat, and they celebrate the feast, and they don't celebrate the pagan uh, Greco-Roman Catholic Church uh, holidays, and they get persecuted for it. Uh, so, and sometimes they go back because of that uh, persecution. Verse 14, And that which fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out, go out, and are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of high and bring no fruit to perfection. So they got the word, but because of they, they're in among thorns, they have heard the word. They are glad. They, they actually have simcha. They have kata. Uh, they celebrate, but yet the things of this earth of the cares of the ages choke the words and choke the word with worries and riches and pleasures of high and bring no fruit to perfection. So they have no fruit. And that on the good soil are those who having heard the word with a noble and good heart retain it and bear fruit and endurance. So this is what was found in the book of Lucas, but we're going to focus on verse, we're going to focus on Matthew Yahoo, chapter 13, verse 3 through 9 and 18 to 30. Let's go to it now. And he spoke to them much in parables, saying, See, the sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some indeed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. And we're going to see what, what, what's devouring them. And others fell on rocky places where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprung up because they had no depth of soil. Verse 6. But when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And this is the, you know, many of us have, in the beginning, we... We probably started off with one of these. We were probably sowed on the wayside. We probably were sowed among thorns and the cares and riches of this high uh, choked us up. And some were scorched by the sun. And because they had no root, they withered. But yet in the future, months, years later, we pick up the word and we get more grounded and we're sowed the seed of the word is sowed on good ground. So some of us can go through this in the beginning. Christians call it backsliding or slipping away or things like that, or going back to Egypt, as they say in Israel, because they don't use backsliding. They use, we came out of Egypt, uh, they, and they're going out of Egypt into the promised land. In verse 7, the others fell among thorns. And the thorns came up and choked them. And others fell on good soil 
and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And as we know, <laughs> these scriptures are very, uh, as we read it, and we read it over, it's very self-explanatory. It, it, it's self-evident of what is going on on the different seeds. But we're going to read continually in verse, and, sh and skip a little bit to verse 18. You that hear the parable of the sower, when anyone hears the word of the rain and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is that sown by the wayside. So there's a wicked one. His assignment is to steal the seed and to have the birds come. Uh, and that's why the birds is a symbol of the wicked one that steals the seed, eats it up. So uh, it snatches it away that was sown in his heart. This is that sown by the wayside. Birds could see the seed better because it's on the wayside. It's not rooted and grounded in good soil, surrounded by other uh growing already sprouting out wheat and growing together so it's snatching away the wicked one is the one that's snatching away and that sown on rocky places this is he who hears the word immediately receives it with kata with simka so immediately he receives it and he's 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 so grateful he's excited um, we call this the honeymoon in, in Christianity. They call it the honeymoon of salvation. And when things come their way, they fall away or they, they get in a rut. They don't feel uh, the presence as much. They don't feel uh, as good as they did in the beginning when they first accepted the Messiah into their heart and asked forgiveness of salvation for the toning blood. Because... You know, everybody feels uh, good when they ask forgiveness one to another. Even gangsters forgive one another, go to each other and say, hey, homie, I'm sorry what I did to you. Uh, you know, we can fight it out if you want, but I'm apologizing to you. I did you wrong. And they settle their issue in Shalom. Okay. So even they feel good when they ask forgiveness. The secular world, if they ask forgiveness one to another or say, forget about it, you know, and we're not going to hassle or talk about it no more. They feel good and relieved because it's a part of the, the Torah right rule that's in the atmosphere of the earth to that when we ask forgiveness one to another, it's released. Then we can go to the Father and pray and get our answers of prayer. And that sown on rocky places. This is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with kara and simka. Yet he has no root in himself, but is short-lived. And when pressure or persecution arise because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now, because of the, the word, people ridicule them, disrespect them. Just like when we come to be followers of Yah, and the messianic understanding or the more in-depth Hebrew understanding and getting into Katab, Paleo, Ibrit of the ancient Hebrew, you're getting persecuted from the rabbinical Talmud, rabbinical Jews, uh, from traditional Israeli rabbinical Jews. You're getting persecuted from them. You're getting persecuted from messianics that are messianics. they partially Christian and messianic and then you got the ones that are par partially messianic and rabbinical judaism so some of the the what they call in latin synagogues or assemblies of those categories they'll persecute you as soon as you open your mouth and start talking clean words of ibrit they start to persecute it and it causes a stumbling block and with the pressures of persecution arise because of the word. What word? The word of Yahuwah. The word of good seeds planted on good soil. We are watering the seed that's been planted into you, planted in you already on good soil. We are watering and bringing increase 
to bring good fruit, fruit with seed in it, not this genetic modified seed on uh, fruits of today that have no seed for reproduction and, and replenishing and producing others' fruit of your kind, but good seed, not the genetic modified seed of today. And this is spiritual speaking too, just like we see materializing today going on with corruptible seed on this earth. Well, there's uncorruptible seed and there's corruptible seed as we're going to begin to learn more. All right. And so they immediately stumble. Now, we're not the ones that stumble. Verse 22, and that sown among the thorns is he who hears the word and the worries of this age and the deceitfulness or deceit of riches choke the word and it becomes fruitless. Some people have um, actually, they get the word and it's not persecution. It's because of the deceitfulness of riches a uh, choke the word. The cares, the riches of high. They have, they have to give up certain jobs that they're making a lot of money because of those jobs. There's, there's sinfulness and corruptness and you slowly break away to find a better job and it becomes harder and more thinner to find more of a job that's kosak, kosher to work at and more cleaner environment. All right. So you end up uh, having problems as well. And But then in verse 23, that sowed on the good soil, you see who hears the word and immediately and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields some a hundredfold, some 60 and 30. And so now we're going to go to verse 24. Another parable he put before them saying, the reign of Shamaim has become like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Now, I know I'm getting, he, he's going back to back for a reason. Our Ibrit Mashiach Yeshua is going back to back from the from one of the the soils, the path, stony ground, thorny ground, thorny ground, excuse me, or good soil. And then now he's going to come to seed. And I want, we know that the seed, if it's good seed, is the word. And it's planted in good or by the side of the road. The birds could see it. And the, it says the wicked one comes to devour that seed. He devours it up. He eats it up. And he'll try to get you distracted in religious spirits of occults and religions or Baha or New Age or other particular feel good, don't have to be accountable religions. He'll allow you to go in that direction, but he'll keep you from uh, from getting on the, the good soil. Okay, And of course, the thorny ground and the stony ground, they have their own pressures of riches or persecution and trials and tribulation because of family sake or because of jobs and things like that. But now we're going to look at the seed, emphasize more of the seed. We want to be more understanding of who's the one that's planting the seed, okay, when it becomes of tar, tares. Another parable he put forth before them saying, the rain of Shamaim has become like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men, while men sleep, the enemy come and sow darnel or tars or weeds among the wheat and went away. As you see here, uh, you can tell the difference between the wheat and the tares. Some people say tars, but the tares. And, and also we know that among the wheat and the tares, there's also, if it's plump with nourishment of vitamins and minerals, it, but when it's coming to full, 
fullness of rightness, it bows, it bows itself. It bows before the Shamayim to the Creator. The tares is stiff neck, pride, high minded, puffy, head in the sky type of of grain. And it's wheat, it's weeds, okay? It's a tear. It's what they say in this particular uh, passage. It's the darnel, okay, among the wheat, and went away. So this is the distinct difference between each one. One is plumped and ready, and one is more greener, and one is stuck. When it is dry, it seems ready, but it's not bowing. But some of them, as you see here, are bowing because some are wheat growing among the tares or the darnel. darnel. And remember, wheat bows itself before the Creator. And that's how you can tell that um, it's good food and good nourishment. Verse 26, And when the blade sprouted and bore fruit, the then the darnel or tares or weeds also appeared and the servants of the master of the house came and said to him master did you not sow good seed in your field from where then does it have the darnel and he said to them a man the an enemy did this and the servant said to him do you wish then that we go and gather them up? And he said, No, least while you gather up the darnel, you also uprate the wheat. So what we're going to do is, we're going to look at a different translation here. Ethros is the enemy, okay? An adversary, especially Hashatan. Okay? especially Satan, enemy, foe. Verse 29, but he said, no, least while you gather up the darnel, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together with the, until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, in the end times, I shall say to the reapers, first gather the weeds, the darnel, the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my granary or its storage. And so as we look at this, we know an enemy or a shatan is the one that did this. And as we go back and look at verse 25, and it says, but while men slept, his enemy came and so tares and among among the wheat and went his way so the enemy you know if he's not stealing good seed he's planted his wicked seed so in the scriptures they talks about a corruptible and uncorruptible seed on this earth so we're going to look at that particular corruptible or uncorruptible seed on this earth that's walking among us. As we see here in Greek, ekthros, which is to hate, hateful, passively, uh, actively hostile, uh, adversary, hashatan, enemy, foe. Okay? So the devil, hashatan, uh, especially enemy and foe. All right, so he comes not to steal the seed, but he come to sow a mixture within the wheat. And this is the focus we're looking at right now. And we're going to go ahead now to another direction. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22, Kepha and Aleph, verse 22. And we're going to look at something of a hint of understanding that the uh, the Shilakim, the disciples uh, of Yahushua, knew and learned from the Mashiach. What we read 
about the wicked one sowed a wicked seed. So he has his own seed on this earth of wickedness, which we call tares or granal or weeds. Weeds are a little different. You know what I mean? The, 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 the darnel or the tares, they actually look like wheat, but they don't bow themselves heavy and bow before the Creator. But as we look at verse 22 and 23, and now that you have cleansed your lives in obeying the truth through the Ruach to undisguise brotherly love, one, love one another fervently with a clean heart. Having been born from above, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the living word of Aloha, which remains forever. So what remains forever? The word of Yahuwah. But the word of Aloha remains forever. And this is the word announced as the good news. Okay, so now to you, found also in Isaiah Yeshua 40, 6 and 8. Now, as you notice here in verse 22, I skipped a few verses here, but he says, being born again, not of corruptible seed. Now, as we look at this, we know that born again is the Greek word for abajineo. It's part of the, 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 the Greek word Gene, okay? Anna, Geneo, Gen Geneo. So it's a part of the, of the genealogy of where you came from, okay? But he wants us to be born and regened from above, regenerated from above, not of corruptible seed. So there's corruptible seed, as explained in the parable, as we read and Matanyahu, okay, that the enemy comes and sows the tares, okay, among the wheat. So there's a corruptible seed on this earth, but of incorruptible, but the word of Yah, which lives and abides forever. As we look at it in the key, Imus, okay. So, and of course, uh, corruptible is decay that implication perishable, okay, and in the Greek. So now, let's also go to Yohanan Alev, John 1, chapter 3, verse 7 through 10. Little children, let no one lead you astray. The one doing righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. And it gives you a footnote, chapter 2, verse 29. The one doing sin is of the devil, because the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the son of Aloha was manifested, to destroy the works of the devil. So the reason why he was manifested is to correct us, help us to understand the Turat, the right rule, marriage covenant instructions, and to destroy the works of the enemy even the religious spirits, even the doctrines of men and devils that are rampant and the main leader of Christianity today, from Catholicism to the Reformationists and on and on to today, uh, which is a part of the works of Ashatan, because he mingled his seed, his seed among the righteous and give an outward show that they are tov, or good religious people, but inwardly are dead men's tombs, as it says in the scriptures, okay? Which also gives you a footnote of Titus 2.14. So he, it's the devil. Everyone having been born of Aloha does not sin because his seed stays in him and he is powerless to sin because he has been born of Aloha, born from above, regenerated, regened. Let's look at this in King Imus. All right, doesn't have Anna in front of it, right? Born again, it just says, generic, regened. He's got 
procreate, recreate, regenerate, bear, begot, be born, bring forth, conceive, delivered of, gender, make, spring up. Okay, so you're born from Yahuwah, the way he created us to be. In this, the children of Aloha and the children of the devil are manifested. Everyone not doing righteousness is not of Aloha, neither the one that loving his brother. In reference of John 3, you know, 3, verse 11. So love is the main one showing the fruit of where you, what seed is in you, what fruit is bearing from that seed inside you, or what seed do you have? Do we have the Monsanto seed? They started off uh, working on corn and from corn to wheat to different crops and fruits and vegetables nowadays. Not all they can modify. And then we have non -gen genetically modified food in the stores that people, some of it says genuine or organic, but some of it is false still. But we see that in the same way Hashatan has doing it physically on earth, he's doing it spiritually as well with his counterfeits or the corruptible seed line. We want to go now and look at the beginning, how the enemy did this. And there's a corruptible seed and an uncorruptible seed on this earth. And we want to see what is the corruptible and the uncorruptible. As we go now to Bereshit, Genesis chapter uh, 3, verse 15. As we begin to read in, in, in the beginnings or in Bereshit, uh, we're going to see how there's hints of a corruptible and uncorruptible seed line that's going to be planted on this earth of, of wicked people, which we know we had a flood to, to, to uh, mikvah tevila, the earth, and cleanse it and bring it from one point to another to clean a lot of the species of the plants and animals and fish and birds, etc., that have been corrupted on the earth pre-flood. But as we look at this in verse 15, and I put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, he shall crush your head, and you shall crush his heel. And it's the first promise of the Mashiach that he would come. And as the enemy comes to slay our Mashiach or promote, provoke the rulers and the Romans, the Goyim, to slay our Mashiach, it was a form of bruising his heel. But at the same token, when he shed his blood, he crushed the head, he crushed the head of Ashatan, the enemy. How did he do that? Well, David, when he cut off the head of the corruptible seed of Goliath, of the Nephilim offspring, the babies of fallen ones that have led up to the Nephilim, and crushed, and excuse me, cut off his head, and he buried the head on a hill, which eventually was called Skull Mountain, which Skull Mountain means Golgotha, so, or Calvary. So it's revealing that his blood crushed the head of the seed of the corruption on the earth. So the enemy had to be more distinct. He can't be obvious. There's pictures, which I'm going to show some of them to you, that of uh, particular ancient pictures of the Vatican where they are reptilians walking among us. There's maps. In, this, in, in ancient maps of a America or ancient maps of the earth in Europe and the Middle East, where it showed nine species. And as time went on, it went to five species of corrupt seed 
on the earth. And so there's different species. So the enemy had to be more distinct. He can't be so obvious, walk around looking like greys or reptilians or or with with horns like Alexander the Great or other things like that. He had to be more human looking to be subtle and crafty to fool the people and the people will not be fearful of these beings and more of being more superior to them okay ruling over them and so let's look at now chapter six and this is the generation of noach noach was a righteous man perfect in his generations noah walked with aloha now as we look at this maybe i should just go ahead and read all the verse 12 then we'll come back and noah brought forth three sons shem ham and yafath and the earth was corrupt before aloha and the earth was filled with violence and aloha looked upon the earth and saw it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth so he as we look at it in Ibri, we're going to see more of a breakdown. But the flesh have been corrupted on the earth. In other words, their gene, their DNA, their function, their rightful function as coming from the offspring of Adam and Hawa. And, but, and it was filled with violence. So let's go back to verse 9 and let's look at it more in Ibri. These are the generations or the genealogy. Tolda, Tolda, the history, the birth of the descendants of genes, their genealogy. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. So he was, his genes were still truthful, perfect, sincerely sound, without spot, undefiled, upright, whole. Okay, so entirely his genealogy was good. It's more closer to Adam and Hawa. In his genealogy, a door, okay? The age of generations, the dwelling, evermore, gene, generations, gene, all right? So he was perfect. And walk with Aloha. And Noah begot his sons, Shem, Ham, and Zephath. And the earth was corrupt. And corrupt is, is, is Sakath. Okay? And it is cast off, corrupt, destroy, mar, perish, spill, spoil, wasteful. Okay? So it was corrupt before Aloha, and the earth was filled with violence. Okay, Hamas, leaven. So it was filled with Hamas, like leaven, all right? And violence, wrong, damage, false, injustice, oppressor of, vi of un oppressor, unrighteous, violent, against done, violent, dealing wrong. Verse 12, and Yah looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh, Bashar, was corrupt upon the earth. And Yah said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, and the earth is filled with violence. So, as we know that there was a form of a plot of the enemy. It was more obvious. There was a, there was a particular uh, messengers that fell to earth. And they are actually, I didn't get the scripture. I'm just being quick to share with you. And those messengers found in Enoch were locked up in dungeons and chains of darkness, which is found in Jude. And those dungeons and chains of darkness, they're waiting for judgment, who have corrupted their way, as it says in the book of Jude. Let's go to that and see that scripture. 
So we're going to Yehuda, uh, chapter 1, verse 6, and it says here, uh, And the angels, or the Balaks, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great Yom. And as we read it also in the book of the messengers who did not keep their own principalities, but left their own dwelling, he has kept in everlasting sac secludes under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And of course, in the book of Enoch, it talks about he put them in the, the sides of the north and buried them in a place, you know, big mountain underneath them. And they're the ones that you could have a physical sex with women. Um, there was a corruptible seed that crept through. We believe that many of them hibernated during the flood time and came back out after the flood to uh, bring mixture again, because there's mixture again on the earth with the Nephilim, uh, and, the, and the, in particular in the land of Canaan, the land of giants. So as we look at this, we see this, but we're also going to see, as we look in the book of Jubilee, uh, Perek 7, Basuk 21 through 25, and for only of these three things came the flood upon the earth, namely owing to the fornication wherein the watchers against the Torah, the right rule of their ordinances, went a whoring after the daughters of men and took for themselves wives of all which they which they desired chose. As we know in Bereshit, it says that they, the, they call them the sons of Elohim, but they were sons. They were Malachim that fell. And then they took, they had desire for the women of men. Okay. And they made, excuse me, verse 22. And they made the beginning of uncleanness and they begot sons of sons of the Nephidim, and they were all unlike, and they devoured one another. Of the giants slew the Nephil and the Nephili. Nephil slew the Elo, and the Elo man, uh, mankind, and one man another, and every one sold himself to work iniquity and to shed much blood on the earth, was filled with iniquity. And after this, the sin against the beast and the birds and all that moves and the walks on the earth and much blood was shed on the earth and every imagination of desire of men imagined vanity and evil continually. So it's almost like the same verse. Uh, the imagination of the wickedness was continually evil found in Bereshit. So there's a reference of, of, of reference there. But it says even among the beasts. So that's why we had the satires, the goat-like man figure, or the part man and part horse. Uh, so there was, they, they, at that time before the flood, the what they call the frequency of the DNA could coexist together of a foreign seed of an animal with another animal or a man with animal, etc. But now, after the flood, the fathers changed this thing and kept us from crossing over to animal seed, which they're trying to genetically modify today, having animals born in cows of pigs, having pigs with human heads and different species they're experimenting, which you can go on Google Earth or, excuse me, Google Image and pull those pictures up. The next picture, but the seed of Noah was pure. The DNA was clean. The gene was upright. And here's a little image of that as they're building the, the ark. And we believe that he was much taller than all of us of today much, much taller. And so the, here is a, a picture of that so you can get a little visual. And as you know, today there's wicked seeds on the earth. I put a few characters here 
And even that little picture, of if we had a way of discerning or seeing that they're walking among us, and these are some examples of wicked seed on the earth. And uh, when I was a chaplain in the Federal Bureau of Prisons, as a chaplain, there was a lot, a lot of wicked people that had closed cases, courts, that was not public of their crimes they did to human beings, of serial killers that had wicked seeds, and most of them were in the occult or some form of witchcraft. As you see here is a coin of Alexander the Great. You could pull that up and Google the image. Alexander the Great had horns, and you would see he had horn, horns on the side of his head, and he had supernatural strength. That's why they eliminated him. But Alexander the Great also had a little tail. And there's been many more that had horns and tails in Greek mythology. They call it mythology, but yet uh, in colleges they acted out. And uh, they actually, many of them were half-breeds. Uh, Grace, there's a tomb for the goddess Grace, and she had little horns as well. There's a tomb for different particular, uh, for uh, the one they call Thor. Thor is another one for Thursday. He's another one that was a half-breed, the offspring of his father, of Helios, and uh, who raped his mother, as the story goes. And there's many, many more of Zeus. Jesus is another one of half-breeds that were among us. And so, and of course, Zeus, Jesus is the one they get the, the, from the word today, Jesus. Uh, but the, Jesus was the one that, that they lined up the Yuadim when the Greeks took over Jerusalem and made them eat the sacrifice of pig in the Ba'i Kodol of the house of Yahuwah in Jerusalem. And then they made them eat the pig to live or die if they didn't eat the sacrifice and worship Jesus at the time of the season of the year that they worshiped him. Because the Romans and the Greeks, they were very religious. They worshiped, they sacrificed for every day of the week. Every And then when the new month comes in, they sacrifice for that deity of that month. And among other other deities, hundreds of deities they sacrificed to. They were very religious people. Next uh, picture. This is a little example of, you can go online to Google Image as well and see movie stars and actors that a certain lighting would reflect a serpent type of eyes. They still are exposed to certain uh, bounce of the light. Uh, there's many books I've read where um, sound men and people that do the what they call the gray or white light boards of reflecting light, interviewing to certain actors and movie stars and princesses and of the royal, they call the royal blue blood sea line of Great Britain. And, uh, and while they're interviewing them, there's certain manifestations that comes about of them. Okay. Uh, Lady Gaga, there's stories about they, that half man, half woman, Lady Gaga, where they, then they're setting up interviews and the lighting manifests and they see it and they even said out loud, uh, I know you see it, go ahead and say something, no one will believe you. So, but we also got people that do it, I put the one in the core far right, where people get the contact lens of reptilian looking eyes and put it on. So, there's people that one with the man or the contacts of the mannequin. This is how they sell it for people that are in the cult and they want to morph themselves. They want to look like that. But the other pictures are people that have, have actually are caught, uh, off guard in camera. Uh, the black actor that's above the, the mannequin, he puts contacts on to make himself look like that. Of course, in this next photo, they were superheroes, and uh, they were the superheroes of the days of Greek and also of Roman times. And also in Great Britain and Europe, they had their Thor, they had their Lunar Monday, uh, and they had the 
Tuesday and Friar Day and Wednesday and, and Satire Day and Sun God Day and, and in the and the superhero mighty ones of Europe. But I have a picture here of the Greek ones of Atlas and Hercules and Apollo and Eros and uh, and Mercury and all of them, which um, Mercury also has some of the symbols uh, of the snake and the eagle. Today, we have a problem that's happened among us. Today, we have the superheroes of today. And the superheroes of today, they're Marvel heroes. And I watch some of them sometimes, and I see the subtitle, Subtle, uh, sneak in. First, it started off with Batman when I was a young man. And from Batman, it went to, uh, uh, well, it was also Superman. Okay, so Superman, then Batman from the Marvel comic books. And then eventually they morphed to all the different comic book superheroes. Okay, which are literally half human and their DNA is slightly different. They've been morphed through their DNA and offspring. Uh, the Hulk is through radiation, to a certain type of experiment gone bad. But also a lot of them were offspring of fallen ones and fallen mighty ones from the ocean to animalistic to the birds to fly. They have certain abilities and characteristics. And they also have Diana, as which is the moon deity, uh, the goddess of the night, if I use that word, term to express it, and, and, and which is a Jewish woman in, every, in Israel. They just drool all over and proud of her, but she plays a pagan goddess, okay, walking among us as a superhero. And they have no idea, because they don't read their Torah, they read the Talmud of the commentary. And they let things pass because they're famous. Now we're going to go to another jump, another aspect of this understanding. And we're going to be teaching it and sharing a little bit more. This is going to be in part two as we go into the what they call the uh, a particular staff. And uh, which... This is a hospital that shows a fallen messenger female with seven points of light on her crown, on her head, and the two snakes. And we're going to go into another level of that and share that in detail on part two. So I'm going to close for now, and then we're going to go into what's going on today among the medical industry as we look at this particular understanding from mercury to all the different mighty ones and the and the symbols and the false uh, lies and deception that this is supposed to be the staff of Moshe with a snake in the wilderness if they get bitten by venom they'll be healed by looking at the venomous snake so this is to be continued part two come and watch part two